Hello and welcome to a new webinar in the series BIM for Geosciences. My name is Magnus Ramon and I'm working as a BIM strategist at NGI. Today's agenda consists of one engineering geology related presentation and one geotechnical presentation. First, Jessica and Tom will present how to use a 3D model to plan and follow up a new rock cut during the construction phase. Here they will also say something about future di digitalization work when it comes to rock cut, cut construction. Second, Eirik will demonstrate how, to, how the workflow when performing geotechnical um, calculations can be made more efficient, especially when working on projects with a large amount of cross sections. As in early webinars, there will be possible to post questions in the chat. We will try to answer some of them during the webinar. In addition, all questions will be answered and posted on the landing page when you, where you signed up for the webinar. The recording from today's webinar will also be posted on NGI's YouTube channel. So if you want to watch this again or share it with some of your friends or colleagues, please visit our YouTube channel. Here you will also find our previous BIM for Geosciences webinars. That was the practical information. Uh, now over to Jessica and Tom. Yes, thank you, Magnus. So we will present uh, 3D modeling for planning and construction follow-up of a rocket. And we will use an example um, from the Intercity Westfall railway line. So the agenda for the, this presentation will first be to go through some the, the actual engineering geological challenge some words about the workflow, the data collection, and then in the first phase, the design and planning phase, we will look at um, detailed modeling with identified joints and blocks. And in phase two, construction follow-up and a large scale modeling and stability analysis. And ending with some, uh, with some ideas and um, some, some further developments and, and innovations in this uh, topic. So the actual challenge, we are, we are, if you look at the map at the down right here, we are close to the city of Horten in the southeastern part of Norway. Uh, it's a construction process uh, going on for a new railway line, um, and it will cross the highway, as you probably see here. So on the part of this new railway, we have a big rock cutting where the new railway will will uh, kind of leave the existing railway and the existing railway has to be in operation during the whole construction phase. And on the upper right of the image there, you see this uh, rock cutting, the existing rock cutting, and the plan is to, to blast or the operation is in phase uh, already, to blast away the rock mass here into the rock mass and establish a new rock cutting uh, some meters inside the rock and ending up with about 40 meter high and 200 meter long rocket to be excavated next to this uh, railway in operation. And that's, uh, that's uh, kind of a challenge. So the involved parties in this job is the, is the client, of course, Bonn and Nord, the national railway uh, authorities in Norway. We have the joint venture contractors up in Nord. We have Jarden Fjellsikling for rock support, Skanska and Kjellfoss for blasting and rock removal, Multiconsult uh, and also Geovita, and Geovita has been a, a partner for us in, in this uh, work. So the two main engineering geological challenges is first uh, to do the risk assessment of existing rocket, and secondly to, to, uh, to make some uh, uh, support for decision regarding blasting plan, stability assessment, and the design of rock support in, uh, in the new rocket. So we have divided this workflow in phase one in eight parts, where the first part deals with uh, data collection with the LiDAR scanner and uh, photos from drone. Second step to import the point cloud into MapTech Point Studio to do filtering and trimming. Third step to combine and mesh the photogrammetry model and LiDAR point cloud into MapTech into one model. In the fourth part, we do the semi-automatic joint mapping in MapTech. And then we go to the grouping of joints, doing some kinematic analysis and visualize potentially unstable blocks in MapTech. 
And these three last parts, there is an increasing degree of research and um, development. Uh, so in the fifth part here, we visualize the joint planes uh, in the rhino grasshopper environment. In number seven, we visualize potential unstable blocks with the required bolting capacity in kind of an integrated 3D model. And, and in the end, we end up to, to visualize the joint planes in the new planned uh, rocket. So for the data collection part, we do both drones uh, photograph, photography and uh, LiDAR scanning. So the challenges here has been to, 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 to uh, remove all this vegetation of ex and, and also existing rock support net and filter away that in a manual way. And you also see that some information that could be valuable for this uh, semi-automatic joint detection uh, is, is removed and that has been a, a little challenge. Uh, and we have used this combination of drone photo and, and LiDAR scan because you see it's problems of drifting of the, the photos from the drone model in the set direction, especially for these very steep, uh, steep walls and also for overhanging rock. So that's the reason why we use this combination of LiDAR scan and, uh, and drone photo. We also did uh, quality control of the measure joint orientation and other kind of quality checks in the field. So it's not only pure digital, but also always important to check in the field that this is, is okay. And we see, and we actually did this in the last part of the project, that is important to, to use the kind of existing information that is available in the, in the construction project to, to make this uh, as an efficient process. And then we, we use drone photos that is quite normal to collect at uh, construction areas today. And also LiDAR scan, uh, scanning that is uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, that is very normal to use for, for uh, as build documentation and uh, documentation required in, in contracts. So, so we use that information in the, in the last part. So we do we go. Thank you. In the first phase, um, before the blasting of the rocket, we did uh, automatic, semi-automatic joint mapping using MapTech Project Studio software. And you see that in the rocket, which is the existing rocket, you see a persistent horizontal joint near the bottom of the rocket, and it could possibly develop into a uh, fault. And this is how we can see that in the field, it's difficult to assess this uh, part of the slope because it's partly covered by rock supporting net. And using a 3D model, you can have a better overview and have a larger scale perspective of the whole rocket. We did semi-automatic rock joint mapping of the whole existing rocket, and we grouped the rock joints using stereo net plot. As you can see here, we have um, identified four groups of joints, and you can also see that we, um, the horizontal joints that we map is having some variations. We also use the um, data from rock joint mapping to identify potential wedge slides and also planar slides using kinematic analysis. You can see that we, if we combine two colors of the joints here, which represents two joint sets, one can uh, form some wedges and it has potential problem when one blasts the existing rocket to form new slope. Here shows uh, where one can identify potential planar slides in the rock cut. We also use the grasshopper Rhino 3D program to extract potential unstable blocks and to calculate its volumes. Um, Rhino and 3D, Rhino 3D and Grasshopper software is a 3D CAD program and one can use it to uh, write scripts and do parametric modeling and design. So it has been useful in both visualizing the 3D model and also to do calculation. And here shows some examples of the potential unstable blocks that we have identified and where we have calculated 
the volume. This is a closer look of it, and one can make use of Rhino 3D and Grasshopper script com in combination to show um, examples of how one can set in bolts to stabilize these blocks. So this is an example of how one can use it for a visualization tool and also in the future to do calculation. Yes, so over to the to the stability assessment for the new rocketing. Uh, we all already seen all these uh, risk uh, joint planes identified with automated um, planning of uh, rock joints. Uh, and now we kind of uh, try to extrapolate how these joint planes will uh, cut the new rock uh, cutting. You see the digital model here in, in red or pink in a way. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about to think about these joint planes. I like uh, infinite joint planes. Of course, it's not like that, but more like in a local area. You can think of it like that in when you haven't any more information than, than this. So first, so, so we see here from one joint plane where you kind of think how this will intersect the new uh, rock cutting in, in planning. So if we first include the joint set S1 identified in the first phase, you can see how this cut into the new rock cutting like this. And we, then we include some of more of the joint planes. So this is for all the joint sets that is uh, with a risk for planner slides. Now we also include the joint sets uh, that uh, have risk for wedge slides in the in the new uh, rocketing over here, and in the end we end up with with such a model where we have all the intersecting joint planes from the established rocketing, and of course this is quite idealistic, but it's the best we have. We haven't been here yet, so it's uh, and it, uh, this will act as a support for the decision for the blasting plan, and for instance that we see we have more risk for wedge slides in the right part, for instance, uh, and, and all the kinds of, of kind of movement of the rock when you start to blast in this section, and that could affect how you plan uh, each of the benches and the kind of blasting system and support system. And that, that could be quite valuable in the, in the, uh, in the next phase. So it's over to you, Iska. Thanks. So when we come to the phase two, we follow up how the construction goes. After they have blasted the first bench, um, a drone scan was done again. And here we see a very obvious sliding plane on the back, visualized on the top of the blaster slope. And if one combined with the existing rock cut, we interpret that there could be a potential sliding plane that goes all the way from the front and to the back, which we can see after the first blasting. And we use um, LeapFrog to model the sliding plane. And here we can see an overview of how it looks using um, Grasshopper and Rhino 3D, combining with all the scans from the first blasting and also the existing one. And here you can see the planned rock cut where the sliding plane can actually cut through all the way along the plant slope. In LeapFrog, we use different data sets to model the sliding surface. As you can see, the sliding surface is curved in a, like a concave way, and we combine data from different um, data acquisition methods, for example, on the top where we did surveying and to the side, the blue disks show the field measurements. And we also combine the rock joint mapping in the phase one and put it as an input to leapfrog. The blue disk here shows the structural geology data. So one point means one dip and strike measurement. 
And we also use the contour line to trace how the sliding surface will look like. And using this, combining with the topography from the DM, the draw model, the plant rock slope, and the sliding surface, we take some typical cross sections in three parts of the slope as input to do a numerical analysis. And he shows how the cross sections look like. You can see that in the south it has um, blasted more and it has a smaller volume than to the north. We use the 2D rock science RS2 program to do a um, finite element analysis of the slope. And you can see that without any rock support and with the plant rock slope, we'll have an SRF stress mm -hmm. reduction factor less than one. It means that the slope will be unstable. So we have um, used a very rough um, numerical modeling analysis just to see how it will affect um, the results or the stability of the rock cut if one use a lot of rock anchors to support it or to reduce it to half height. And in both cases, in order to achieve a stable situation of having SRF to, to one, one will have to have to install a lot of rock anchors, which means a very high cost and also the time. And we have used two different scenarios of having 25 degrees and 30 degrees for the friction. And Tom, please. Yes. So, so the construction it's in uh, in full operation today. They are blasted every day and support every day uh, because the, but this takes a lot of time. But the status from the 28th of May was like showed on these uh, images. And uh, we have kind of identified the, the, that weakness uh, plane or surface as we identified in the model. It, it fits quite well, as uh, Jessica will show in the next uh, next video. And you see the, also this very slick inside of the rock surface with a very low friction angle. So when we were uh, quite conservative for the values in the numerical model, and we see that it, that it was um, uh, quite smart because uh, the, the actual friction here is very low uh, and that would have been a big risk if we had um, tried to support all this uh, kind of valley side with lo long anchors and uh, this would have resulted in a very high cost and, and, and a lot of support. So here uh, this work made a big contribution to the uh, to the decision support of blasting all the way into to this uh, weakness plane. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. So when it decided to uh, blast the whole volume out, they did a drone scan again after they have blasted more. And it shows that the sliding surface that we first model is slightly um, deeper than in real reality. And so we did a remodeling of it. Using a new drone model, we pick out the surface that is ex exposed again, which is gentler. And then we put it into the leapfrog model again to run the modeling. And then in the end, we get this blue surface, which is uh, will contribute to actually less volume than we first anticipated. And in the end, even though the volume is less, it will still cut the plant uh, rock cut. So it is a good idea to actually take out all of the volume instead of using a lot of energy and cost and time to support the whole slope. OK, so, so based on all this, um information and what we have learned in this project and also in other projects in NGI. Uh, this uh, spring we have worked on a research application or a call from the Norwegian uh, Research Council uh, for and that we have called the DigiGround where the aim is to, to use digit 
digital tools and automation to our groundworks using uh, AI and BIM modeling and a lot of digital tools. Um, and um, just to go briefly through uh, some of these packages, uh, we have one package where we focus on, on, on rock support and more we'll automate the whole process and digitalize the whole process related to, uh, to rock cuts. And secondly, to, to, to make the whole stream of data flow from the BIM design model into the construction pit uh, more seamless than today. And third, to build a digital twin of the ground model, including all this data that we that we collect to do quality control and so on. And in the work package four, to, to address uncertainty and quantify uncertainty uh, in this digital twin model and visualize that in a digital twin model. That is uh, quite problematic to do that today. And we have a, we have a lot of partners uh, in place, both national and international partners, and from research and commercial partners. So, so, so we hope this will be positive. Uh, I guess we will have some reply on this in, uh, in August or something, but uh, let's hope so. So, um, and, and based on, on uh, DigiGround, um, we have had some ideas for the further digital assisted process for rocket uh, construction. And we have kind of uh, divided uh, the future ideas into two tracks where the first track is uh, is shown here on the on the left, where we basically use the same kind of method of assessing uh, stability and rock support as we do today, that we kind of manually uh, show where to put the bolts in, in a very field focused uh, working process. But we able to treat the model from scans or, or photo of the blasted rocket with the installed rock support. And we use machine learning that is quite major today uh, for uh, image models and so on to find rock support um, uh, and uh, all, all kinds of rock support in, in, the, um, in, the, in the rocketing to digitalize that into the 3D model. And we do the automated joint mapping. And we include that also in a 3D model. And then we end up with a kind of a digital twin of the existing rock cut with uh, the rock mass, the joints, the rock support that can be used for quality control in the field uh, and also ch uh, checking uh, at the office. So that's kind of uh, the first track that could be used for existing rockets, historic rockets, and also the, the, um, the rockets where we use the kind of the, the work process that we use today. Secondly, we use a more, or we think about the more through the digital process. And of course, that's that's very important to point out that you still, of course, have to be in the field to check that this is OK and maybe do some uh, editing and revising. But it's much more digitally focused and use all kind of the tools that is um, that is available today. So we have this, this 3D model built from LiDAR or photogrammetry photos on a routine basis after blasting for instance, for every bench of blasting. And then we have kind of a follow, following up a loop that carry, we carried out until the entire rocket is complete. Where we start with automated joint mapping, as we showed here for boulder rocketing. We visualize that in the 3D model. We do the checkout of individual blocks. We find individual blocks uh, and properties, and we automate the stability analysis of each of these blocks uh, using different methods. That's something to research on. If it it's, could be a, quite, a, a combination of parametric, probabilistic, uh, equilibrium analysis, and, and so on. And, and use that where we have the volume of the block, then it's much easier to do a more automated rock support uh, identification and design of uh, bolts and drainage holes, nets, and, and so on. Then we import this data from the design. Uh, into into the bolting rigs, uh, and so we have the geometry of the rock uh, rock support, and you can perform uh, this uh, out in the field, of course, with a check with the men operating the rigs and so on. Check that this is okay, 
And as a next step, that's a very important step, uh, is to include the use of measurable drilling also out in the field on the surface. That is quite normal to use in, in tunneling today and gives a lot of valuable information for, for making decisions on the ground. So we see that, that as a very important step to also include measurable drilling in, in rock cutting. Uh, and then we also need to position the rigs and so on. It's a lot of things that's not in place yet. But we use this MVD uh, information also, and we include that in the same digital twin model. And we can use this information to kind of revise and update the design of the rock support that we already have done. Quite normal, as the same way as we as we do for, for tunneling in a way today. Uh, and then the engineering geologist, in the same way as for the first track, can use this for quality control, uh, of the full digital twin, including every kind of data you need for um, for making good decisions. And then, for instance, we can show uh, this uh, the information with the augmented reality model, like uh, kind of putting the digital model on top of the the real um, real life uh, rock mass outside, or all the ways so kind of visualize this design model. And in the end, we have a a uh, very good as uh, built model, of course, but we have a model including all data, a digital twin model that we have used in the design phase, in the operation phase, and, and it will be used for future um, future operations of the rocket and, and check out. So this is the last slide. We just send some big thanks to the Ban Noor and Geovita for collaboration, sharing of data and constructive technical decisions. So, so thank you to you. Uh, and then uh, over to you, Eirik. Yes, thanks. Um, so we are moving um, now from uh, kind of the realm of rock engineering into a more um, technical engineering related topic. Uh, but that is not, uh, not to say that if you are an engineering geologist, you should really, uh, leave the meeting now because uh, you might find it useful any uh, anyhow, uh, at least I hope so and think so. So what I will show you is uh, a little something I made at a point when I was working with uh, um, with uh, cross sections, as we do a lot as engineering, as you know, as geotechnical engineers and engineering geologists, I guess. Um, and I was thinking that I I do this in kind of every every project, and in some projects I make a lot of them and the calculations I perform are, uh, there are many similarities between each project and, uh, and I really thought that I spend a lot of time on this and it really shouldn't need to be that, be that way because there are so many similarities uh, each time and it should really be, be possible to automatize it a bit. So uh, I made a little uh, script in uh, something called Grasshopper which is a plugin for the uh, computer aided design software Rhino. Uh, this script uh, I use to automatically export cross sections. And uh, you know, it really doesn't matter if it's one or if it's uh, five or 10, it, um, the am amount of effort is um, more or less the same and that's kind of the aim. And afterwards I'll show you how you can uh, go from there and into Plaxis, which is the software um, many of us use for our finite element um, modeling. So first, having a look here at the Rhino um, window, you see uh, a clip of my uh, of my screen. And what we're looking at is uh, on the left hand side, uh, you see a map uh, more or less. And you see there are some buildings and roads and so on. And on the right hand side, you see uh, that there are also three surfaces here. So the bottom one, the purple one, that's the bedrock surface. And the blue one is the um, boundary between dry crust and clay underneath. And the top one is the terrain surface. So that means that uh, we assume uh, now that we already know uh, a lot about the soil layering and uh, also we uh, know this whole properties. So what we'll do in this demonstration is I'll show you how 
how I can very quickly um, export some cross sections from this um, from this uh, model and then perform some stability calculations. We'll um, uh, use three cross sections. So you see one here and one here and one down here and you see them also projected on the terrain uh, over here. Uh, so those are uh, the three that I'll, uh, I'll show you now. Uh, you know, it could have been five or ten. It wouldn't really matter, but for demonstration purposes, three is nice. So opening Grasshopper then, it's the uh, icon up here. So this is a plugin for Rhino. Um, I guess it's what you'd call a, uh, a visual programming language. So uh, it looks like this, of course, and the uh, canvas, as it's called, would be empty if you open uh, an empty Grasshopper script, but now I also opened uh, my script for uh, cross-section exporting. And this works kind of like every other uh, programming language. There are uh, functions, or rather they are called components in Grasshopper, and they have some input and some output, and they, uh, you kind of connect uh, one function over here, for example, with another function with using these wires. So the wires going in the left hand side is the input, while the wires going out on the right hand side are the output. And also, of course, you have uh, input and output uh, from and to uh, the Rhino. That's kind of the, uh, the point, uh, entire point. You can work with uh, Rhino geometries and do some um, do some uh, actions. Uh, on your geometry and then get something uh, useful out. So uh, this component here is um, kind of the main uh, part of the script and it uh, hides a lot of other components on the, uh, on the sub level. And on the left over here are the input, which we will have a look at now. So this script, it uh, with it I can export cross sections and I can uh, the top box here is uh, it, it contains two options. It's either uh, exporting or creating cross sections uh, in place, uh, like in the XY set space. And that would be useful, for example, for uh, exporting to a 3D calculation software, for example, Plaxis 3D, or uh, for you engineering geologists, uh, 3DEC, which I also uh, used uh, this script for uh, making geometries for. The other option is mapping your cross section to the XY, which is more useful for 2D calculations, such as in Plexus 2D. So that's what we'll do now. Then there are some options here just for uh, whether or not you want to insert a cross section in, in the origin, or if you want it inserted at another insertion point, and whether or not you want it, uh, you want them to be stacked on top of each other, which is fine uh, if if we want to export some files and do some calculations. But for example, if you would like to create drawings or visualize all the sections at the same time, then it, they shouldn't really be stacked on top of each other. So it's just something um, for handling that. And then, then there are some options for making a grid and the scale of the labels of the grid. Um, well, this one is uh, more interesting. It's the uh, export type. So we'll use CSV type now because um, uh, then we'll get a text file with coordinates in the form of uh, comma separated values. And that can be easily read into Python. And then we can use Python to control plexus. You could of course also export as DXF, for example, which would also be perfectly uh, feasible for this use because DXF files can also be easily imported into plexus. But now let's do a CSV. Then there's just uh, the folder in which to save files. So this is a relative path, so we'll save it to the folder called export in the folder in which this script uh, is saved. Well, here is kind of the main inputs. So these uh, curves, boundary representations, uh, that is to say surfaces and meshes, that's the geometries which you want to include in our cross sections. It's the geometries if you want to cut. So you see that curves and meshes are uh, orange at the moment, which means that these boxes, these components contain no, no data. 
well in the BREP uh, component, I have already set um, these uh, uh, these surfaces as okay. You don't see them as uh, good anymore, but uh, you, you remember those three surfaces: the terrain, the track rust bottom boundary, and the bedrock surface are already set in this BREP uh, component. And then there's the sections, those three lines, which uh, re um, represent the, the location of our cross section. This is just a prefix to our exported file names. And then there's some options for simplifying the geometries, which is actually uh, handy for uh, calculations in Plexis, but we'll rather do that in Python now. Uh, you could have, could have done it here as well, but we'll do it in Python. Then there's an option for exploding polylines into line segments, um, which we don't need now. But this one is actually quite important at the moment because for our comma separated value file, we need uh, we need coordinates, so we need points. So uh, we'll export CSV files containing the coordinates of all line vertices. And then there's finally these two, which I more or less runs the script. So this bake button, baking is uh, the term for exporting geometries from Grasshopper and into Rhino. So this one takes our geometries back into Rhino, while this export button creates our uh, uh, comma separated value files. And I just mentioned briefly earlier that this component here contains a lot of different things and you can see uh, if I hover over it, we'll get uh, kind of a uh, preview here. And if I click inside it, we'll see there's some different things in here and another another uh, level actually of, uh, of, of components. I won't really uh, go into detail on that, but you know this thing actually contains now uh, things for simplifications and different things and creating grids and so on. So it's actually um, actually what you really need for creating cross sections isn't uh, that hard at all to create in Grasshopper. It's kind of the main geometry generation happens over here, while the baking happens here and the exporting happens over here. So kind of most of it uh, in between is kind of nice to have, but isn't really the base functionality. But uh, never mind. Okay, so we'll now just see what happens if I run this uh, Grasshopper script. As I mentioned, we have these two options regarding the space in which to create the geometry. So we can see if I um, generate this preview that uh, something uh, is actually generated. And if, we, if I just uh, turn off some layers here, you see that it actually looks, um, looks sensible. So we can then uh, instead choose XY, which is the useful uh, format for our Plexus calculations. And going to a top view of the um, area around the origin, we see that now we have all our um, geometries stacked on top of each other here. The other input we just discussed, so I'll just click the bake button, and all these layers start uh, appearing. So I uh, will just have a uh, look and see if it looks uh, good before we export it to CSV files. And we see that indeed there are three sections called webinar section one, webinar section two, and webinar section three with an XY suffix um, because this is in the XY space. So we just uh, turn off two of them and have a look and it looks sensible. There is, um, there is a grid and there uh, is some info and there are these three lines representing the terrain and the dry crust bottom boundary and the bedrock uh, surface. And we can just uh, verify also that the other ones looks uh, it should look uh, basically the same and they seem to do they all contain similar information so then uh, just before we uh, make our export i'll uh, you know as i thought this maybe looks uh, a bit like uh, magic i'll do like a proper magician and i'll show you that uh, my export folder here is actually empty I uh, could just as well not have existed for that matter, but uh, it now exists and it's empty. So um, we'll just see then if uh, we get some CSV files in that folder when I 
export. So I have to turn the layers back on uh, first. And then we see that uh, at least something seems to happen. And we have these CSV files now containing, uh, hopefully, points. Uh, so we see, OK, we have uh, points for the bedrock surface here with uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates, set being zero. Uh, and we have the dry crust as well. And we also have our terrain, uh, the line re representing our terrain as points. So that's uh, basically uh, it uh, for, from, uh, from Grasshopper and Rhino, which may, it means that we can proceed uh, doing some calculations on these cross sections. And what we'll do is um, we'll use Plexis and Python to perform some stability calculations, just some very basic calculations, but just to show how this uh, can, be, uh, can be done. So I open here now my, um, well, it's the Plexus uh, window. I guess many of you recognize it on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I have, um, I have uh, a clip of a um, of Spider, which is the uh, environment I use for Python. And to uh, control Plexus using Python, you basically just have to go to the expert uh, settings and uh, configure the remote scripting server by starting it and copy the password and the uh, input port. You see uh, they are um, written as input over here. And then you need to locate the folder in which uh, you have your Plexus um, libraries for, uh, you know, these are modules that you need to import into Python. And when you download Plexus, you get, get something like uh, this folder. And uh, the other inputs here, because this is the input part of the script, it's it's only the um, folder in which I said, or in which we saved uh, just now our CSV files. It's the uh, folder in which you want to save our Plexus calculation files, or the, I mean the input files, and also the output, um, like uh, maybe some figures. And then there's uh, the option here for uh, simplifying a bit. I mean, we got now a lot of points on our uh, lines, so we need really to simplify and, uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't really mesh nicely and it would uh, take forever to, uh, to run. Um, so we simplify a bit. And then there's the amount of the maximum number of steps in our safety calculation phase and something about mesh density. If you use Plexus, you will recognize that there are um, basically five uh, options or five base options for mesh mesh density. There is very coarse, there's coarse, medium, fine, and very fine. And this can be tra translated into numbers. So 0 0.12, um, which I'll use in a kind of a uh, Plexus specific um, command uh, in Python, 0 0.12. Uh, represents uh, a very coarse mesh, but that's fine for this demonstration. The final uh, thing here is the groundwater level, which is specified. We didn't have our groundwater level in our cross section, so we specify it here as two lists. The top one is our groundwater level elevations, and the bottom one is the uh, corresponding terrain elevations. So for a terrain level of zero uh, meters above sea level, the groundwater level is also at zero, while when the terrain is at 35 uh, meters above sea level, the groundwater level is well uh, 50 meters below, at 20 meters. So that's uh, a bit on the input here, and we I will just um, show you how how this runs. So starting uh, the script here, this is the spider environment. So I get a message that I need to define some materials in Plexus, and I've already created them in this material database. So we just import them like that, and then go back into Python and press enter. And what uh, I've done now is I created the, something for, um, well, I, uh, I have Python uh, reading and remembering my choice here, such that for the next cross section, uh, the materials will be automatically defined. So from now on, the script and uh, will control Plexus and it will run until it has finished all three cross sections. Because what happens is that I loop through all the CSV files we created, those three files, and for every one of them, 
I read uh, all the coordinates into Python and uh, thus find out uh, how many layers there are and um, uh, the uh, position for each uh, each line. And then I uh, create a set of unique X values. That's where we want our boreholes. Boreholes is one way of generating geometry in plexus. Uh, so uh, you basically define your layering at each in each borehole and plexus will interpolate between. Uh, so, um, but, as I mentioned before, I uh, create my boreholes. I do some simplification such that the minimum distance is five meters. And then for each borehole, I use the information read from the CSV file to create this layering. When we've done that, we move into the uh, structures pane over here. And still everything is done by um, Python, of course. But we move into the structures pane over here and create our boundary conditions. So on the side boundaries, on the vertical boundaries, I've added a, a normal uh, fixity here, a, a zero x velocity condition, which I guess really shouldn't be necessary because it's the default option in Plexus really, but it's still nice just to be completely sure. And then on the bottom boundary, I um, I have a full, uh, fully fixed uh, condition. And then uh, the final thing to do is to mesh, of course, uh, and then to move into the uh, stage construction pane in which we define our faces. So um, uh, we actually are looking at the final section now in uh, the calculation uh, in the stage construction phase. So I have four faces here, uh, a gravity loading initial phase and some in intermediate phases here. Uh, the reason for having those uh, really aren't necessary for this calculation, but maybe one wants to add some, some uh, like uh, maybe an excavation or I don't know, something could be done on, in those phases, and then a safety calculation in the end. So we've actually finished our three cross sections now, and we see that we've also opened practice output along the way, and we see some um, total displacement contours. And we also exported those as figures. I'll um, show them shortly. And we got some uh, factors, factors of safety down here. So we see that section one is uh, quite good. Well, section two and three maybe aren't, uh, well, depending on your requirements, of course, but um, maybe aren't that good. So then uh, it's, you could, for example, include in the script some, uh, Maybe some re remedial actions could be included, like counterfills or uh, excavation, or uh, you know, really, it's um, you can add different uh, fun functionality in here to expand um, what this script uh, can do for you. I think actually my final slide is just uh, a uh, I've copied these three figures that we exported, so we see the the mode of failure here. And that is, uh, I guess that's what I had in mind uh, showing you. So we've seen how one can use Rhino and, and Grasshopper to automatically more or less create cross sections. And it wouldn't really matter if we did like 20, for example, it would be uh, no more effort. And then one can go into Plexis and use Python for uh, doing some calculations. And I've shown some kind of basic stability calculations, but as I mentioned, you can expand the, the functionality and do more advanced stuff. And although as of course, as the complexity increases, the chance that you'll be able to reuse it directly in your next project kind of decreases, but uh, the number of modifications needed uh, doesn't necessarily have to be, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be hard to implement. It could be a, a quick uh, thing and then uh, you'd, uh, get going uh, really fast. So I think uh, that's uh, all, uh, all from me. So thank you. And uh, if there are some questions, of course, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, so then I guess it's back to you, Magnus. Thank you, Eirik. Also, thank you to, to Jessica and Tom for the presentations. I'll share my screen now. Um, we got some questions during the presentations. Um, the first one is if the slides or 
the video will be available after the webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, this will be available on the um, NGI's YouTube channel. Um, we also got one additional question about the slides. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to share them. We have to have a small discussion on that. That's also because the, the large amount of content is the videos, so we have to have a small discussion on that one. Um, finally, it's a question to Jessica and Tom um, concerning the, um, how important and time consuming is QC by engineering geologists? I'm asking this since autom automation seems a main theme here. So I will leave the meeting before it ends. I'm not sure if we should answer it here, Jessica and Tom, or if you should just write an answer afterwards. I, I can try to, to answer it as I understand the, the question. Um, I think I, I first want to point out that one of the big aims here is also to increase safety. We, we have seen a lot of, uh, or a lot of, we have seen some bigger uh, rock falls from rocketings. And we probably have a lot of over supporting too in other areas because the, the process today is kind of very manual and subjectively focused making decisions. So that's uh, one of the first and important aims that these tools will uh, give you better decision support. But, but secondly, for, for the, the QA uh, in the field, that's always important. I, and I guess we can think about two issues here. One is to kind of in the development phase of, of such uh, tools and for a new rocketing. Normally, maybe we, we, we have uh, hundreds and thousands of square meters with the rocketing and big projects. So in, in the first phase to, to check that uh, the, we, we find the jo uh, rock joints, to see that the bolts uh, placed uh, by this fully digitized process is, is placed in the right manner. And, and probably this is something we have to kind of experience and find the, the right way of doing it. Probably we have to uh, go quickly over the whole rock cutting at the office and in the field, maybe using augmented reality and so on. We have, we have to kind of find the, the way to do this. Uh, but we should also remember that today we use days and days for QA and uh, yeah, have a manual, manual process and you have to also do the decision in phase. Here, here the kind of the decision is already taken for you. You have a design uh, or um, a decision from the model making a decision for the rock support and you have to kind of check is this okay or is it not okay. So that's kind of the, the first uh, Q&A for the engineering geologist. And secondly, you have two steps more. You have the actual operator of the rock supporting drill that also is a, a very big competence in uh, kind of check if this is see, see, this seems to be okay. And lastly, if you manage to include measure by drilling data, that will be a very important quality control system uh, to, to be able to check the, the, the placing of rock, uh, rock bolts, the, the intersection of joints and so on later. And remember, remember today we have kind of nothing. I mean, don't know how the joints persist into the rock and uh, it's a lot of more subjective uh, decisions made. So yeah, that was a long answer on the, on the question, but uh, yeah, so much is. Was a long, but it was also a good answer, Tom. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I don't think it's uh, any more questions. So then we'll just say that that was all for today. Uh, we hope that you all enjoyed the presentations. And if there are any more questions that comes up after the, after the webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, you can find the email addresses for all of us on the on the on the page now or on the, the screen. Um, NGI uh, are um, are looking for geotechnical engineers who really wants to combine geotechnical work with parametric programming. Um, so we're going to have an advert uh, which will be on NGI's homepage either today or within the future days. So if you are interested in joining the NGI team, um, please check out uh, the advert or you can also contact me either on, uh, on email or on LinkedIn or, on, or whatever. Uh, we're also planning a new webinar in the autumn. Um, we're not decided fully yet when it will be, either September or October. Uh, so again, follow us on uh, 
on LinkedIn and Facebook. There will be some uh, info there about both the time and content where we're getting closer to, to September. And I think that was everything. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining the webinar today. Um, and I wish you all a nice evening. Goodbye.